Okay, I guess we can get started now. And uh, welcome everybody. Sure glad to see you. Um, sure glad you're able to show up today. And uh, we'll certainly be praying for those who are dealing with uh, illnesses and different problems. And uh, let's go to Lord in prayer quickly. Lord, we Thank you so much for the opportunity to get together. We thank you that we're still free to meet together and to study your word. We pray, your Lord, you'll help us to be wise, wise um, as serpents and harmless as doves in, the, in these cultures that are turning demonic, basically, right before our eyes. Lord, I pray for those who are suffering with different ailments today, that you would just be with them and help them, help their doctors to know what to do, and I pray that you would bring healing uh, if, it's, if it's your will. Lord, we just thank you and pray that you would bless this time together, help us to learn what, we, what you want us to learn uh, through this lesson. And we ask it in your name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, uh, today we're moving on to the subject of kindness as uh, a, uh, uh, a, a uh, fruit of the Spirit. And the Bible, of course, has a number of uh, examples of kindness. And, of course, probably the main one people would think of would be the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, Luke 10, 30 through 37 says, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And when he put the man on his own, uh, then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You know, a very clear point to the story is what Jesus said at the end, go and do likewise. Hmm. Kindness is not really kindness unless it's done. Not to go, he doesn't say to go and think likewise, don't go think about it, or go understand about it. We need to put kindness and mercy into action, or else it's nothing but pity that leads to pride. Kindness without action is useless. It does no good for the person that needs the kindness, nor for the person giving the kindness. The priests and the Levite knew all about kindness, but they did nothing about it. Because they did nothing about it, the man continued to suffer and would have most likely died, if not for the Samaritan. You know, anyone can be kind. <clears throat> Samaritans were considered to be the lowest class of people. Uh, that lived around Israel. As Christians, we are to help the less fortunate, fortunate, no matter how rich or poor they are. We can always be of some help, even as, if it's just to be a friend. Mark Twain once wrote, kindness is a language that the deaf can hear and the blind can read. He was right, of course. Everybody can understand the language of love, it can be spoken in any dialect and still be comprehended by a person of any nationality, both rich and poor, 
old and young, male and female. Kindness is a universal language where it does not speak to the intellect, but it speaks directly to the heart. We are called to be kind. Well, here's some examples of kindness. Many times we are blind to the needs of others around us. A contemporary mother of five lost her vision through illness. She struggled with her blindness and she had always been self-sufficient doing things for herself. Now she had to depend on other people to do things she once did for herself. Through this experience, she realized how much she needed other people. After losing her sight, she began to notice things around her that she had never noticed before. There was a young man who had been born blind who stood on the street corner. When she had her sight, she never paid any attention to him. But now that she couldn't see, she spoke to him, and eventually they became friends. She discovered that he'd never had a birthday party. So I baked a cake and organized a party, she said. He blew out the candles and he couldn't see. He was delirious with joy. She describes her experience in most interesting terms. She says, I felt so happy. I had come from that blind person on the corner to someone who had seen a need and done something about it. You see what she was, you see what she was saying? It was that she was blind before she was blind, blind to the needs of others. But now being blind, she could see. I've told people that sound uh, that uh, something that sounds a little cruel, she says now, everyone should experience temporary blindness to see how our vision can give us hangups, how we can judge and condemn, and what that does to us all. She was able to help that young blind man on the street corner with love and kindness. She gave him a birthday party. He met a blind girl and was beginning to fall in love with her when someone with sight told him that she was unattractive. Oh, how nice. As a result, he stopped seeing her. It brought tears to my eyes, the woman said. He'd been seeing fine. Yes, he'd been seeing fine until some so-called seeing person misguided him. You know, there are two kinds of blindness, of the eyes and of the heart. That's the first thing we need to see. We need to understand that sometimes, even though we can see physically, our heart is blind to, what's going, to what we should be doing, to people we should be helping. Now, the following is from a message by the late David Wilkerson, and I felt it was appropriate to the topic of kindness. And so I'm quoting from it here. It's from a a sermon he did called Taking Up the Towel. <clears throat> There's something very important about kindness that we need to remember as Christians. We are to show kindness and mercy to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. There's a traditional service that some churches in the States have, and it is called a foot washing service. It's a church service where people wash one another's feet. The origin of this service they have taken from a passage from John 13, where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He told them, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. That's John 13, 14. Unfortunately, these types of services sometimes become a tradition, and the true meaning of foot washing is lost. After Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he asked them, do you know what I've just done for you? In other words, do you know the spiritual significance of what I've done in washing your feet? I don't think that Jesus was starting an ordinance that must be observed by the church, such as communion or baptism, when he did this. Otherwise, I believe he would have submitted to a foot washing himself, as he did when he was baptized and ate communion with his disciples. All the commentaries I've seen comment on this scene by saying that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples humility by his example to them. But I believe that this is only part of the truth 
of what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples and us. I believe that what Jesus is trying to teach us in this passage is that he wants us to take up the towel. Many times we read scripture and we don't search hard enough for its deep meanings. All scripture is inspired by God and has layer upon layer of deep meaning. For example, scripture tells us, by love, serve one another, Galatians 5.13. And submit yourselves one to another in the fear of, of, of the Lord, Ephesians 5.21. You know, it may be easier to picture how we can submit to one another, for instance, in marriage between a wife and a husband, or for children to submit to their parents. But how can we submit to each other as the body of Christ? I believe that we can understand this better by looking at, the, at this, how Jesus taught us to take up the towel. Submitting to each other in love and godly fear is much more than just obeying a higher authority. There are three words in this example by Jesus that give us some idea of how to take up the towel. The words are dirt, comfort, and unity. The disciples were 12 men beloved of God and who loved him. But they also had dirt on their feet. Jesus was showing them that maybe their hands were clean, but not their feet. It's like walking on the hills to go to a garden. We can walk all the way there and our hands can remain clean, but our feet are going to get dirty. Jesus says that you as a born again Christian don't need your whole body washed, just your feet. This is not your liber literal feet he's talking about, but your spiritual feet. When you walk through this life as a Christian, you are saved and God has already washed you with his blood and saved your soul. But because there are temptations in this life, your soul, your soul still needs to be washed from time to time. Let me tell you that no matter how dusty and dirty the roads in Jerusalem were at that time, the roads of our day are much more filthy. I'm not talking about actual dirt, dirt roads, but the roads of worldly temptation and immorality. Perhaps you can see this in the life of a brother or sister in Christ. Perhaps you've gotten your own feet dirty this week. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean you've turned your back on God, unless you're unwilling to repent of your sin. But you need someone to wash your feet. You fell, you hurt yourself, and you need your dirty feet washed. Scripture says, brethren, if a man is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Considering yourself, lest you are tempted. That's Galatians 6 1. We'll get into that uh, later on. We are commanded as Christians to restore every other Christian who falls into sin if there is a repentant heart. What do you do when you're face to face with another brother or sister who's fallen into a sin? What you do has everything to do with what your Christianity and walk with Christ is all about. Do you serve others in love and kindness and submit to them in the fear of God? Or do you talk about them behind their back and pull them down while boosting yourself up? You know, people who call themselves Christians can be very cruel sometimes. Sometimes these so-called Christians even delight in seeing dirt on others. But let me tell you, when you spread the dirt around, that's the dirtiest sin of all. There have been many pastors I've seen or heard of who have resigned from churches because of a sin they fell into and the people of the church were simply unwilling to restore them, even though they were repentant. I have been in a number of places where when I arrive there, all I hear is destructive talk about others in ministry. This really makes me sick sometimes and I wanna tell these people, don't say another word. Let's stop right now and pray for that brother and sister, then go talk to them and clear this up. Isn't that what the Bible tells us to do? Taking up the towel takes commitment and courage. It means I'm committed to helping him or her clear, clean off the dirt 
I will get down on my hands and knees and do it myself through prayer and humbleness, if that's what it takes. I will work to restore their reputation, their family, to do everything I can to keep them alive in Christ. We are to reconcile people to Christ. That's what our job is. We must take up the towel of God's mercy and go to that hurting one. We should not just stand around and spread the dirt. We should not just judge that person we have when we have our own sins and faults before God. We need to go directly to that person in the special love of Jesus. We need to submit all our human in inclinations to ignore him and judge him, expose him, lecture him, or find fault with him. Instead, we are to commit ourselves to being his deepest friend. We are told to wash away his sins by sharing the correcting, healing, washing, washing, comforting word of God. Now, we're, we have to be clear here. We're not talking about Christians here who are not repentant, who are living in continual sin. We're not talking about false teachers who are teaching destructive heresies and leading other Christians to shipwreck their faith. We should pray for them, but allow God to work in their lives through our prayers. I'm afraid that this way is also not seen too much when I was out being a missionary in Micronesia, because unfortunately it conflicts with the cultures there. People are very unforgiving. If a person falls into sin in, in the islands, People come and say, you must have done something wrong. They're like the friends of Job. You must be living in sin. God's judging you. But where culture conflicts with God's word, it's wrong. If a brother is not repentant, they are to be warned two or three times. They are to be confronted with the sin with one, then two or three witnesses. And if they're still unrepentant, the Bible says they should be disfellowshipped from the church and given over to Satan for a season. And there's a good reason for that. If someone is in, unrepentant or living in habitual sin, if they're allowed to just continue to fellowship with those who are following Christ, they will believe they will believe that what they're doing is actually, it's okay. This is what happens so much in the modern church. And you know what? They may also infect others with their sin. It's better for them to find out what it's like to live in darkness for a while, where they used to be. Because chances are they will come to their senses through tragedy and really come back to the Lord. But when a brother or sister in the Lord are repentant and in need of love and kindness, we need to take up the towel of kindness and mercy. I know a man who is in need of being disfellowshipped from a church. I fear for his soul. He's living in sin and unrepentant. Yet the church is just ignoring him, talking about him, about him behind his back. The church should be up front with him. Either put him out of the church for being an unrepentant sinner, or if he's repentant, wash his feet. I heard a story about an associate pastor of a big church in the U.S. whose teen, teenage daughter became pregnant outside of marriage. The senior pastor of that church demanded that the associate pastor go before, before the whole church and tell them what his daughter had done. Because he was being obedient to the senior pastor, he did it, but that devastated his daughter. It broke the family's heart. The congregation wallowed like a pig who rolls around in the mud in all the details of the poor teenage girl's sin. A year later, this is the, top the senior pa pastor, uh, pastor's daughter also became pregnant out of wedlock. But the senior pastor did not follow his own advice and did everything in his power to cover it. You know, it seems very easy to throw dirt into the wind, but when uh, when some of it gets on us, we begin to understand what it's like to need love and mercy. Jesus also taught the com concept of comfort. In this case, comfort of sins removed. 
In Corinthians 5, we read the story of a man in the church who fell into a terrible sin of incest. Evidently, the man was unrepentant because Paul directed the church to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh and hopefully the saving of his spirit. Paul did not say the man was lost and going to hell. No, he wanted him isolated from fellowship and given over to Satan's devices so he would remember what it was like to live in darkness and perhaps come to the end of his rope, to his wit's end, and be driven back to repentance. Later in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul found the same man had become repentant and that the church had forgiven him. Satan had indeed brought him to despair. The lust of his flesh had been broken and he had come back repentant. And now Paul writes to the Corinthian church, you ought rather to forgive him, lest such a one as this be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I ask, ask you that you would confirm your love toward him. That's 2 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. The church came together and comforted this man. You know, the world gives us just the opposite picture and teaches us the wrong way to deal with these issues. Look at how a politician announces he's running for office. The press turns into a swarm of mosquitoes trying to bother him and dig up anything from his past life that looks a little bit dirty. When they find it, they print it all in the headlines for everybody to see. Even politicians and political parties do this to each other. You've seen a lot of that lately. You can especially th see this during election time. This world has gone crazy with slander. TV is full of talk shows featuring gossip, exposure, mockery. The wicked person seems to get a thrill from destroying people, families, and reputations. The more dirty the dirt, the more people like it. This kind of thing has no place in God's church. The church ought to be different. It ought to be a house of cleansing. I suggest that if you want to restore a brother or sister, you don't need to know all the details of how that person got dirty. Jesus didn't ask the disciples, how did you get such dirty feet? He wanted only to clean their feet. His love for them was unconditional. In other words, he did not love them because they had, uh, they had or had not committed certain sins against him or others. We should not be asking about the dirt we should be cleaning it off. Often Christians want to delve into all the gory details. They come to a Christian who has dirty feet and say, I want to wash your feet, but first tell me what happened. <laughs> How'd they get so dirty? <laughs> you know, that's called voyeurism. We need, it's a need to feast on the sins of somebody else. Sometimes as a person begins to tell their story, the Christian will realize, oh my, this is worse than I thought. I can't get involved in this. I can't handle it. After a few minutes of details, the Christian comes to the end of the tiny bit of mercy and kindness he started out with and begins to judge the person as too evil beyond help. Many Christians then just drop the towel and walk away. Let me tell you now, you can't wash somebody else's feet while wearing judges' robes. You have to take off your self-righteous garments, your holier-than-thou attitude, your pharisaical mindset, before you can do any cleansing. Like Jesus did in the passage where he washed the disciples' feet, you must lay aside your garment and put on love. Off with self-righteousness, pride, thoughts that you have would never stoop so low as that other person. A true Christian will have the attitude of, I don't care what you did. If you're repentant and want to hear God's word, I will be kind to you. I will stick by you. Now, let me remind you that Jesus even washed Judas' feet. Christ stooped and washed his feet with the rest of the disciples. 
knowing full well that Satan had already begun to put betrayal in his heart. Even a modern day Judas can come to repentance. Such habitual sins, sins that people choose to live in day after day, such as homosexuality, lesbianism, adultery, we think of sometimes as sins that have people hopelessly hooked. But Paul says of them, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Hey, such were some of us, but we had our whole bodies washed by Jesus. Every day, Jesus continues to wash our feet. If Jesus is willing to forgive, why not us? And a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves, that oppose themselves, if God preadventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. That's 2 Timothy 2, 24-26. You know what? We must be tender-hearted with everyone because God may have mercy on them yet. Don't give up. Finally, we come to the word unity. Jesus was trying to teach us a lesson about unity. As Jesus approached Peter, the disciple drew back and said, Lord, will you wash my feet? Jesus answered, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Peter, if I don't wash your feet, we have very little ground for fellowship or unity. Unity in the church does not come from great preaching, good programs, buildings. It comes from taking up the towel. Think back on what Jesus did for you when he washed your feet. He wiped away your guilt, your fault. He cleansed the remnants of sin. You were made whole and clean. He put gratitude back in your heart, thankfulness, joy in your soul. He filled you with so much love that you would follow him anywhere and do anything for him. All you wanted to do was to be in communion and communication with him because of all he did for you. That's the secret of unity. When you take up the towel of mercy for a fallen, hurting brother, you encourage him by embracing him in his hurt, by submitting in godly fear, washing away his feelings of worthlessness, anguish, and despair, and by loving and caring for him. What will happen by your doing this for him? You've built a bridge. You've constructed a firm foundation for true unity and a lasting and glorious relationship between you and him. You are now one by your common experience. That is, you have both acknowledged that you've been washed by the water of the word. You have not seen gratitude and friendship until you've done this. That Christian will you be your friend for life. He will defend you, do anything for you. He will stand by you in your hard times, just like you stood by him. Can you imagine a church full of such caring people? who refuse to hear a single dirty word about a brother, who hurt when their brother hurts, who rally around every despairing, fault-ridden brother and sister with a word of love and hope? Well, you may ask, how do I find people whose feet need washing? My answer to you is the same way you found them when you gossiped about them. Now, whenever you hear anything negative about someone, Merely ask, who are you talking about? Name only, please. Then you go to that hurting person quickly 
and your mercy with your mercy towel and start washing his feet. Tell that person I care about you. Jesus cares about you and I want to pray for you. But I don't need to know any details. I just want you to know I still love you and I'm going to stand with you. Jesus said, if I then, as your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Now that we know these things, as Jesus said, we can do them. I ask you, are you willing to do them? Are you ready to take up the towel of kindness and love? That's what we should be doing, folks. That's part of our calling as true believers.